Good morning. We continue in our study in the book of Zechariah. I'm not going to go through, you know, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, but we are going to look at especially the visions uh, that Zechariah had. And I want to remind you that uh, as a minor prophet, there's more about the coming of Christ, both uh, his first and second coming, especially his second coming and the millennial kingdom, than all of the other minor prophets combined. There's just a, a, so much stuff, and it's set up a lot like the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, the first <clears throat> six chapters uh, are filled with, with history and with visions, and the last six chapters are basically his uh, own uh, diary about you know what's going on. So the two different things. Zechariah, first six chapters are filled with his visions and his conversation with the angel of the Lord. And then there is uh, prophetic utterances or messages that come in the last uh, several chapters. So uh, keep that in mind as we move toward uh, Resurrection Sunday. And as we do so, uh, will allow what is being taught in the book of Zechariah to draw us closer to an understanding of the importance of the resurrection. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to look into your word, open our hearts and our minds and our spirit to receive what you have for us. Draw us closer to you and uh, allow us to uh, be willing to uh, be uh, ready to follow whatever direction you, you guide us in and to open ourselves up to be servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the blessed name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said. Amen. <clears throat> so last week we had an introduction to the book of Zechariah and we went through the first uh, vision, the man on the red horse. And basically... Uh, we understand the angel of the Lord as being uh, uh, the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, in each of the opportunities that we run into, about eight of them throughout the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is mentioned. It, it, it's, the concept is that that is actually the, uh, Christ the Son. So in, in, in a form that can actually be seen and talked to. Not, not in the spirit, but the aspect of, of uh, human form. And in this one, he has kind of a conversation with the Father about what's going to take place. And then the other horses, you know, the angels are there, and they're all, you know, going about the earth and saying, everybody that has um, uh, done your bidding to bring judgment on Israel, they're at ease. And God says, well, it's time now to bring punishment on them because they, what they did, they did with an evil intent. Yes, I used them, but their hearts were evil. And so we need to, to deal with them in order for Israel to understand that they are my chosen. Now, just because they are God's chosen doesn't mean that they're exempt from punishment. And so God brings that on them because their unwillingness to be obedient, but then he brings them back and he allows them the opportunity to repent. What I find interesting in um, the presentation of Zechariah is that the first step is the foundation of repentance. And so you, you, you find... In the Old Testament, especially here in Zechariah, the foundation of salvation begins with repentance. Mm -hmm. Same thing on the other side. 
In the New Testament, as we look at uh, after the resurrection, that the message, especially in, in Paul and Peter, was that repentance was necessary. And that's the foundation. We, we get going towards salvation based on the foundation of repentance. And so we're going to see that same uh, aspect uh, coming to being here. So the second uh, vision that he has is the four horns and the four <coughs> craftsmen. And we're going to look into those uh, a little more uh, closely uh, today. Uh, so in the first vision, God promised to restore his relationship with Israel and rebuild the temple if they would repent and return to him. Sometimes Satan will convince you that because you have fallen into sin, that God no longer wants to have a relationship with you. You've gone too far, you've done this, you've done that, and now you're outside the relationship boundaries. But we see here in, in this example, God says, look, if you'll draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. I will restore the relationship with my people, and I will rebuild the place upon which my presence was among you. My presence was a part of the temple. We're going to rebuild that. We're going to restore relationship. But there is something you need to do. You need to repent. You need to return. And boy, when you read the book of Ezra, you find that the people were just, you know, they spent three days in tears and on their face before God and repenting. And, you know, to the point that Ezra had to get up and say, hey, y'all go home. <laughs> okay? We need to, you know, and, which is interesting because, again, we have an example that while uh, revival is great, there's a point at which God says, okay, now go do something <laughs> with the revival. You remember when uh, <coughs> Peter, James, and John were up on the Mount of Transfiguration with, with Jesus, and, and they just, you know, there they were with uh, Moses and Elijah. So what does Peter say? Hey, Jesus, let's build some altars <coughs> up here, and we'll, the four of us, we'll just stay here. Jesus says, no, you can't do that. You need to get down off the mountain into the valley, take the light to where it, the darkness is. Yes. Revival is great. Being spirit-led is great. Being filled with the spirit is great. Allowing God's gifts to be, you know, there is great. But God says, I don't want you to just stay there. I want you to get off the mountain. I want you to get outside there and go do something with what God has given you. I think sometimes, you know, the feeling is so great of revival and, 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 the, and, and the closeness and the power and all of that is so great. We go, well, let's just camp here and, and enjoy this. And God says, you know, at some point, take this out to those that need it the most. The darkness. They need to see the light. So I'm going to restore your relationship. I'm going to rebuild the temple, but you need to repent, and you need to return. All those who returned to Jerusalem repented and returned to worshiping Jehovah. The temple was rebuilt, and the land was restored. A lot of what's going on over in Israel right now has to do with the land. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go along because there's some stuff that's going on over there that I find quite interesting. In the second vision, Zechariah saw four horns and four craftsmen. So here's what it says. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and we're still in chapter 1, and there were four horns, and I said to the angel who talked with me, that's the angel of the Lord, what are these? 
So he answered me, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing because he talks about Judah and Israel. Now, Israel, at this point, when Assyria came in and scattered the ten tribes, they're gone. They're out of the picture. But they're mentioned here as part of this. Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, well, what are these coming to do? So he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head. But the craftsmen are coming to terrify them, to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah, to scatter it. The four horns represent the nations that were used by God to scatter Israel, Judah, and Jerusalem. Okay? And we're going to find that, that prophetic utterances oftentimes include Israel in this, in, in their presentation. So we need to understand that that part is coming back. Now the only nation to scatter Israel, or the ten northern tribes, was Assyria. And those tribes disappeared into generational assimilation. Assyria had this wonderful idea. Uh, we're going to figure out how we're never going to have a problem with uprisings. And this is what they did. They would take all the captured peoples, all the captured nations, and they were you know, quite large as an empire, and they would take the men of one group and marry them off to the women of another nation, and then they would take their children and marry them off to the others of another nation, and then they would take the, and they would do this until there was no national loyalty. There was nothing left. They were all mixed up. They were totally assimilated into all those nations, so that you couldn't even. Are you a Jew? No, I'm. I'm a. I'm a. You know, Heinz 57. Right. I've got this in me, this in me, this in me. My 11-year-old grandson is into ancestry. I mean, he's just, you know, into all, the, you know, this side and that side, and who got married here and got married. And, you know, when we look back into our ancestries, I've got, you know, Barb's got uh, Russian blood, and I've got Dutch blood, and I've got German, and I've got Italian, and... You know, we're just all amalgamated, right? And that's what they did with those ten northern tribes, so that there was no longer... And, and then they took their gods away. All right? Every nation had their gods. Je Israel had Jehovah. And Jehovah was mighty for them. But now, they took that all away so that they only worshipped the gods of Assyria. So first they took their nationality away, and then they took their God away so that there was nothing left. There was no rebellion. Okay? No need for any of that. While from a judgment on Israel's perspective, the ten northern tribes were taken captive by Assyria, there's evidence, thank God, that families from all twelve tribes lived in the area around Jerusalem and were not taken captive. There is evidence and there is written documents of families from every tribe so that when the time comes we'll have all 12 tribes together <coughs> in the Millennial Kingdom. From that day forward until the Millennial Kingdom is established, only the land of Judah remains intact. If we are to remain true to the actual terms of these visions, then only those nations that removed Jews from their land and scattered them can be considered. Isn't that what he said? He said, those that scattered them. 
That is, those that actually took them out of the land and scattered them. All right? Those four horns, that's what the angel of the Lord said to Zechariah. Those four horns represent the na four nations that scattered them. Israel, Judah, Jerusalem. The nations that fulfill that action are Assyria, because they took the ten tribes. Babylon, because they came and brought Israel out of, and that's where you get Daniel's, as all of them <laughs> taken to Babylon. And Rome, as they took all of uh, them and scattered them all around, especially in 70 AD when they came and destroyed the temple and scattered the people. In 135 AD, they killed 130,000 uh, Jews in a revolt and scattered them throughout their entire uh, uh, nation, empire. And then the nation of Islam. History tells us what happened to Assyria. They got defeated by Babylon. <laughs> History tells us what happened to Babylon. They got uh, destroyed by the, the, the Medes and the Persians. Okay, The Medes and the Persians did not scatter Israel. In fact, they were instrumental, Cyrus and Darius, of bringing them back so they can't be included. But the nation of Islam has been attempting to keep Jews from their land for over a thousand years. Okay, I mean, you could really go all the way back to, you know, Jacob and Esau, uh, Ishmael uh, and Isaac, you know, all of this kind of getting started. But where this really starts, where this problem really exists, is what takes place right here in Zechariah's lifetime in Ezra and Nehemiah, and you read about what took place there, and I'm going to bring that up in just a minute. When the state of Israel was established in 1948, the entire Muslim world attempted to destroy the Jews, but failed. Okay? Today there exists a confederation of at least 10 or more Muslim terrorist factions funded by Iran that are working to eradicate Israel. When Israel came back to the land under Ezra and Nehemiah, during the time of the prophecy of Haggai and Zechariah, there was a whole group of nations, of, of uh, Arabs, that were very angry at the fact that they were going to rebuild the temple and that they were going to start their worshiping and sacrificing again. And so they began to attack them, to try to stop them. But Ezra sent a letter, got a letter back from Darius saying, you guys knock it off. We've given them permission to rebuild their temple and rebuild their walls. You can't touch them. Well, they kept trying anyway. They wanted to do whatever they could do to stop the building of the temple and the reestablishing of the sacrifices. Why? Because Jehovah, when he was in control of Israel, destroyed everybody around them. Nobody could defeat them. When they didn't have that, they were vulnerable. When they were in disobedience, they were vulnerable. So guess what happened before October 7th of last year when they were attacked? Do you know what happened? They brought red heifers into Israel. And they began to talk about the third temple. There was a video of one of the high-ranking generals of Hamas when he was asked why they attacked on October 7th. He said this, because they brought those cows back 
and we're going to prepare to worship. It's the same thing that was going on here in Zechariah's time. And for over a thousand years, they've done whatever is necessary to keep them from building that temple after the Romans destroyed it in 70 AD. We're not going to allow it to be rebuilt. We're not going to allow them to worship Jehovah. We're not going to allow the God of Israel to once again be in control. So that's what's going on over there, in case you wondered. They don't want them to be worshiping. So they brought the heifers. They haven't had a red heifer in 2,000 years. Now they've got them. Five of them. And they will do whatever necessary. This entire group will do whatever is necessary. Hezbollah, Houthis, the Islamic Jihad, all of them from Jordan and Syria, they're all going to try to stop them. They're going to lose, by the way, just like they did in Ezra and Nehemiah. They're going to lose. That's what Psalm 83 tells us, what Isaiah 17 tells us, what Jeremiah 49 tells us. What will happen to this fourth horn is provided for us within the prophetic utterance of Scripture. God will bring judgment on them. Israel will be established as God's chosen. So there you go. That's what's happening, you know. <laughs> and they'll do whatever is necessary to try to keep that from, from going on. That's why, you know, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. We just don't want them Israelites worshiping Jehovah. Got to stop it. So vision three is the man with a measuring line. All right, this, is, this is going to kind of move from what's going on there. Vision three follows a timeline from the day of Zechariah to the time of the millennial reign of Christ. So let's take a look at what it says. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem to see what is its width and what is its length. Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns, not one city, towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, <clears throat> for I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. Wherever you are living, rise up and return to Jerusalem, the land of Judah, for it is holy to me and promised to you. That's what God is saying. God is saying, look, Wherever you are in the world, come back, come back. Well, they did that during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. They did that in 1948, when the state of Israel was established. Everybody come back, and, and the Jews started coming back. They started coming back from Russia. They started coming back. I mean, there was a big revival among the Jews in Russia, and they came back. And 40,000 of them came back. And they began to populate not just Jerusalem, but the area of Judea and the surrounding towns. And now that's all being built up. It's a beautiful place. Now, Jerusalem and the surrounding towns is all starting. And it's the greatest area of changing salt water into regular water. They have developed a very interesting process that allows them to take salt water and make it fresh water. And that is so important in the area in which they live <laughs> that people will do anything to get their water. And their technology. And they have all of this stuff God has blessed them and prospered them exactly the way God said he would among Zechariah's day. But listen, he talks about the land. 
And I want you to notice. But thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. That's a phrase we know. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Notice this. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people, and I will dwell in your midst. He's talking about the millennial kingdom. And the Lord, now get this, this is what he says. And the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the what? Holy Land. And will again choose Jerusalem. Do you know that this is the only time in all of Scripture in which the term Holy Land is used in connection with Israel and shows God's value on the land given to them? Now he talks about the holy mountain and this and that and about the land, but the actual term holy land, and we use it all the time now, right? We're going to go over and visit the holy land. But this is the only time that it acts actually connection. God says, look, this is my possession. It's holy because I am holy. It's holy because I dwell in it. The land belongs to me, and I promised it to Israel, and I don't care how many other groups have been a part of that. That's my land. Okay? And it's kind of like, you know, you have land and it belongs to you. And you went off, maybe you went off and, and were a part of uh, another nation for a lot of years. And then, you know, other people came in and kind of... Uh, use the land and stuff, and then you come back and you go, wait a minute, this is my land. Oh, but we've been here for, you know, a lot of, I'm sorry, but it's it's mine. And, and in fact, it, it's so much mine, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Well, we, we really don't want to leave. Well, you need to because it belongs to me, and it's precious to me. You need to see that that's what's going on there. God says, this is my land. I've given it to Israel. It belongs to them, period. All the way up to the time of Jeremiah, where it's mentioned, the boundaries are mentioned again, all the way up in the Old Testament to Jeremiah. This belongs to me. Here's the boundaries. Now, Israel is only, today is only living in just a little sliver of the land that God says is theirs. Okay. The picture of a city and towns without walls had two applications. First, it was to show God's promised protection against the enemies who would attempt to stop the rebuilding of Jerusalem. That was during Zechariah's time and during now. The second application shows God's promise to dwell with us in the millennial kingdom. He's coming back. Amen? He's coming back. And he's going to set everything right. And he's going to put everything back the way it's supposed to be. You know? Now that will be costly because not everybody's going to be happy with that. <laughs> okay? Just like not everybody's happy with what's going on now. It will be a land without walls because of the multitudes of peoples that will come to be there. Ultimately, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because the Prince of Peace will reign from Jerusalem and he will be her protection. God wants his people to sing and rejoice. This is, you know, God says, okay, great, you know, you're back now. You're in the land, you're back where you belong. Now I want you to sing and rejoice. And you see that in the verses there? Oh, sing and rejoice unto me, worship me, because God will protect the land from its enemies. Make Israel the ruler over those who plunder them. 
and will invite many nations to partake in the glory of the presence of the Messiah. Now, the church today should sing and rejoice because we will be among those invited to partake in the Messianic kingdom. The church, come and be a part of this. You've, you've followed me, you've believed in me, you're, you're, you're part of the kingdom of God. You're, you're the raptured saints, you're going to come with me to set up the millennial kingdom. When Jesus comes to, to set everything right, you're going to be there, so you're going to be a part of that. So we, we, you know, when we sing, we should sing and rejoice from our hearts because of what God has done. We should sing and rejoice because we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Right? That ought to be something that brings great joy to us. So we ought to sing and rejoice, but that's not all. We should sing and rejoice because the Lord is returning to take His church as the bride of Christ. It's going to be wonderful. We should just we should have so, well, man, you don't understand the burdens that I'm under. Yeah, I do. And Jesus knows what you're going through and what you're experiencing and the problems that are there and the bodies that are broken and the hearts that are broken and the spirits that are downtrodden. He said, look, you need, that's why you need to sing. That's why we have music. Did, did you know that the Bible says that God sings? Did you know that? God sings. He has a good voice. I imagine he has the best voice that there is. He probably would get the golden buzzer. You know? He's got a great voice. We need to sing because he's coming back. We need to sing because he's, you know, washed it <clears throat> in the blood of the Lamb. We need to sing because he is our Savior. And we might be able to say, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. How marvelous, how wonderful it is to know the truth of your word and the truth of who you are and the fact that nothing escapes you and even from the being, even from all the way back in Zechariah's time, you are setting for us what's going to take place so that we can look forward to that day and that we might sing and rejoice in what you're going to do in our lives and what you have done for us. In the blessed name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.